The West Penra Papers A Journey Through the Multiverse The Second Level of Learning HTTP colon slash slash westpenry.com Genesis Paper Number 6, The Shamans of Mew, The Fallen Ones, and Corruption of Wisdom by Wes Penra, Sunday, September 2, 2012, HTTP colon slash slash westpenry.com 7. Proof of Giants in Ancient Times Many people have discredited the Swiss archaeologist, researcher and author Eric von Däniken as a hoax, based upon his hottest critics, who are almost always people from the establishment who have furiously attacked him over the years. We may ask ourselves why. Some of his conclusions, however, may not hold water when under scrutiny, and those theories are of course the ones that are viciously attacked in an effort to try to discredit his whole work. No one cares to understand that many of his ideas are just that theories and ideas, in an attempt to put what he has found into context. It's up to his readers and followers to discern and build their own opinions. That's the whole beauty of it, an opportunity for us to think. When we look into von Däniken's work, we find a lot of interesting findings which are hard to explain away. One of those is a follow-up on a previous discovery on Tawara, an atoll in the Pacific Ocean, clearly a part of Old Mew. A book, The Footprints of Tawara was written by I.G. Turbot, extracted from the Journal of the Polynesian Society, Volume 58, Number 4, December 1949, Wellington, New Zealand, on the subject of gigantic footprints that can be found on the atoll for anyone to witness. Von Däniken was inspired by this piece of work and decided to go there himself, and just like the material said, the footprints were there, figure 6 to 7. Some could even be found on nearby islands, but the main spot is in the village of Banriba at a location called Te Aba Ananti, the place of the spirits, or Te Kananrebo, the holy place. They were there, imprinted deep into the volcanic stone in many parts of the island. The footprints are giant and most of them had six toes on each foot. Reports say the footprints are pretty clear and often include the full foot, with toes, heels and outline intact, naturally curved like a human foot. These particular giants, based on the size of their feet, would have been around 10 to 12 feet tall. There is also clear evidence that genetic experiments were taken place at least in certain places of Mew, probably at the end of its existence, because natives on some of the islands, just like the giants of old, have six fingers and six toes, and even double rows of teeth. The Before Its News website reports in an article from April 14, 2011, that although some researchers dismiss the presence of giants in the area in the past, the same researchers can't explain away the footprints. Nor can they explain away the old legends that circulate on the atoll and the surrounding islands that there were enormous giants there in the past, strong enough to move mountains. The natives had to battle these beings of large stature for food and to save their women and children from these creatures, who supposedly were cannibals and ate humans alive. This also corresponds directly with what the Pleiadians say in one of their more recent lectures, who also mention that the Nephilim had a double row of teeth, something the critics can't explain away, either. How come the natives also have it? Coincidence? According to the same legends, humans had to go into hiding while hungry giants were strolling around on the land looking for human hiding places so they could get a good meal. The Pleiadians tell us that the giants were not cannibals to begin with but developed into such as they genetically degenerated, which would have happened towards the end of the Lemurian era. The above article also discusses the footprints, and in his book, I.G. Turbot writes, Here various footprints can clearly be seen in the volcanic stone, some of them so huge as to seem impossible. Most have six toes on each foot. One footprint is said to be his left foot it sinks a good inch into the solid rock, a coral limestone, has twelve toes and measures three feet nine inches across the toes and four feet six inches from the toe to heel. Its counterpart, the right foot, is reported to be near the village of Tekanranga on Mayana, a separate island in the Gilberts some twenty miles to the southwest of Tarawa. On Tarawa, the main atoll of Kiribati, I found the footprints of a giant, his wife and children in a schoolyard in the village of Banriba. They all had six toes. 
8. When the natives were asked why one of the names of this location was Place of the Spirits, they explained that the spirits had nothing to do with the giants, but with the ghosts of the spirits whose bodies the giants had consumed asterisk. It looks quite obvious to me that these footprints and the legends are remnants of the very old story about the Nephilim, Anakim, and Rephaim giants, all mentioned in the Bible. Still, some of the giant footprints found on the Pacific Islands may very well be of the Titans as well. Our history and literature is full of stories about giants and genetic manipulation. Homer's Odysseus is only one, but it actually tells us about both giants and genetic manipulation, the Cyclops and the Minotaur. 8. A Gigantic Visit from the Pleiades Lord E.A. seems to have spent quite some time in the Pleiades, like it was a region of the sky he had a certain affinity for, especially the stars Electra and Maya, and had a great influence over a certain group of humanoid-slash-reptilian giants, to such a degree that he managed to bring some of them over here to Earth. I have studied this connection for a while and found some relevant information on this connection, but the best source again, I have to say, has been the Pleiadians themselves. In a lecture in spring of 2012 they told their audience in a channeled session, using Barbara Marciniak as their vehicle, that they are in fact the descendants of the fallen angels, the Watchers. Their ancestors were the giants of the past who descended to earth, and as the Bible says, found the women beautiful and took them as their wives. Their offspring became the Nephilim, the giants who walked the earth in ancient days. The effect this created is the karma the Pleiadian group, channeling from the future, in our terms, are trying to resolve, because the effects of what they did have had ripple effects way into the future even our future. Speaking of fallen angels, we know from old scriptures that they were connected with Lucifer, the light bearer, and they were rebel angels. The title Lucifer fits well into the character of E.A. slash E.N.K.I., who rebelled against his own people, and the Orion Queen in particular, and therefore also against Mother Goddess. He is the light bearer, because light is information, and he brought information, light, to the early humans and enlightened them. Furthermore, we could probably say that the Syrians, who followed him down here, would be the Watchers slash Agigi, thus the fallen angels. This is one way of looking at it, but the Syrians were not the ones who particularly came down here because they found women irresistible. There were no women here when the Syrians came only androgynous humans. Therefore, the real Watchers are the Pleiadian group who rebelled together with E.A., Lucifer. They were the ones who found Earth women irresistible and mated with them, and later created the giants, as we shall see now. E.A., being the genetic scientist he was, wanted to expand his creation, humans, by perhaps adding an extra set of genes to our DNA. So he went to the Pleiades, more specifically a planet which orbits the blue sun Maya, and brought 200 Pleiadians back to Earth to assist him with genetic experiments and to help him teach mankind, as he did not trust the Syrians with that task. These were the 200 gods angels whom Lucifer, E.A., brought down from heaven the Orion Empire to the third dimension of matter, the Earth. Thus, they became known as the fallen angels. This was not peculiar in any way because the Pleiades was, and still is, a part of the Orion Empire, and E.A. was the Prince of Orion. He must have had followers on many planets. On the firstlegend.info website, the author and researcher also makes the connection between Orion, Lucifer and the Fallen Angels. Most people think that the Fallen Ones came down here in huge spaceships, or were just giants with big wings, landing on Earth, all males and beautiful to envision. Then they seduced the earthly women, had sex with them, and their offspring became enormous giants. This was not the case, however. The whole Bible story about the fallen angels and the Nephilim is about genetic engineering and manipulation. The Pleiadians came here from the nano world, just like any other evolved star race, and took human male bodies here on Earth. Thus, they did not come here as giants, although they were, and are giants on their home planet, compared to our human stature. Yes, they found the human females irresistible, and in human bodies they had sex with them. However, that did not create giant offspring, 
it was just like when any two humans have sex, the offspring were human. However, behind the scenes, the Pleiadians, possibly together with some Syrian groups and EA himself, spent a lot of time on genetic manipulation and engineering. Marciniak's group has many times confirmed their connection with Lord EA, or ENKI, as they call him. Therefore, it's possible that EA and the Pleiadians to some degree at least, worked hand in glove. What the Pleiadians did in essence were to use human DNA, it's unclear if they used the Neanderthal or the Erectus line, or both, and mixed it with their own Pleiadian DNA. The result became another experiment, but the new human probably looked very similar to ourselves. When this new prototype was tested and had intercourse with existing humans on the planet, none of them were yet today's Homo sapiens, who did not appear until after the deluge, the offspring became giants. At first, the baby had to be taken out with a caesarean section, or the poor female would split open when the fetus grew in the womb. So a major part of the fetus development had to be done in a laboratory. However, once they were fully developed they became giants, just like the Watchers themselves, which was probably the purpose. For some reason, EA and the Pleiadians wanted bodies similar to the ones the Pleiadians inhabited in the Maya solar system in the Pleiades. According to Anton Parks, the planet which revolves around Maya, which would be relevant to this story, is a giant planet called Dubhi, often mentioned in the Sumerian texts. Marciniak's Pleiadians also stress that the Watchers mainly came from Maya, and some from Electra, and later on created the Mayan culture in today's Mexico. Some people, understandably so, don't believe that the Pleiades can have planets around them that are inhabited, because the star cluster is too young. In scientific terms, most stars in the Pleiades are only 75 to 150 million years old 14. Unfortunately, mainstream scientists in today's world measure time based on how we do it here on Earth, in a linear fashion. Stars don't die, first of all, they transform into another type of consciousness, and they can't be measured, time-wise. Like scientists do. Another thing they don't understand is that when they are talking about civilizations not having time to develop around stars that young and hot because these stars don't stay stable as long as our sun, they forget one important thing. Who says that civilizations are developing on all planets which have life on them? Why can't star races from other star systems, apart from a particular one we discuss, colonize these planets any time in their development, or seed them? or transport them there from elsewhere if they have the technology. And what time frame are the scientists talking about? All time is simultaneous, so each planet can be inhabited in its past, present, and future at the same time, to use our concept of time. And which dimension are we talking about? We can go on and on, and none of the above questions and comments are taken into consideration by the elite scientists of today. They are looking for life that is similar to Earth, not understanding that Earth is a rare planet in the universe. Life exists in so many other forms and in so many other dimensions and densities than 3D, which is the dimension of matter. Albeit, this may not be entirely true. There are those who start to realize that there is more to things than they have thought thus far. But to be realistic, they have a lot of catch-up to do and it will take time for traditional scientists to fully realize and admit to that they were wrong, this is hard for them, and that the universe is consciousness. On the other hand, those who finance them do not want us to know this, either, and therefore, if mainstream scientists want to keep their funding, they'd better conform to what the financiers want. It is plausible that the Pleiadians with time found another way around having to use their laboratories to host fetuses of the Nephilim. A solution would be to manipulate the DNA of the fetus so that it grew much slower, resulting in that the baby could be born the size of a normal human baby. Once born, the baby started growing in a much faster speed than human babies and children, and once fully grown, they could grow to become 7 to 35 feet tall, the Pleiadians mentions some of them were up to 300 feet tall, which is roughly 91 meters. It is uncertain if these enormous giants were discontinued or not but they must have had a hard time surviving in Earth gravity. 9. The Children of the Dark Angels 
Once the Pleiadian genetic experiments took off, giants of all sizes started to roam the Earth from north to south, west to east. It is said that in the beginning these enormous creatures coexisted quite well with the already existing humans and didn't bother them too much, but the more they noticed their advantage due to their height and strength, some of them took advantage of the situation and began to dominate the smaller and from their perspective, weaker humanity. Of course, these offspring of the Pleiadian fallen angels were the infamous Nephilim, who also found their way to the continent of Mu. Some of these giants were very wise and gentle and fit right into the Lemurian society where they could be of great help, both from giving a slightly different slant on spiritual matters, knowledge some of them seemed to have embedded in their DNA, and from being able to lift heavy rocks, stones and to build houses and temples, although none of them as perfect as the ones inserted by the gods. The Nephilim did not have access to that kind of technology. They worked with their hands. Imagine a 300-foot giant lifting something, if giants of that stature were actually common. A few of them together could certainly lift and move very heavy stones, albeit perhaps not whole mountains, as the legends go. It's uncertain if the Nephilim coexisted with the Titans or not. It could very well be that the few Titans who had survived the previous cataclysm came in one, or just a few groups and stayed in one area while the Nephilim migrated to the big continent from another direction, and therefore they didn't really interact with each other. Another possibility would be that the Titans actually did interact with the early giants, and those who stayed friendly and gentle until the end. Either way, there were others of the Nephilim who were not as friendly, who set themselves up in order to rule over humans. In other parts of the world, this was not as hard to achieve as it probably was amongst the Mu societies who were born free. Conflicts must have been quite common after a while, probably even open wars between humans and giants. Possibly, it could have been during such conflicts the giants got the taste for human flesh and became cannibals, a trait they may have had dormant in their DNA from having some Syrian genes. Just like the Syrians on the battlefield, the Nephilim liked to eat human flesh raw and while the victim was still alive according to legends such as those from Tarawa and the southern Pacific Islands. The interaction between the Lemurians and the Nephilim, however, lasted over a long duration of time, probably ten thousands of years, and this must have been when the cultures of Mu advanced into becoming more urban-like societies, or declined, depending on how we look at it. With help from giants, cities could easily be built, and giant buildings would most certainly have been erected for the Nephilim to live in as well. The Lemurian priesthood became more distant from the rest of the people due to that the whole tribes disconnected from nature to a large degree as they moved into cities or villages. Thus, the shamans also lost a lot of their natural psychic abilities and could no longer connect with the 96% as easily as they used to. Many communities and cities had also been taken over by males who wanted the feminine divine powers and changed shamanism forever in their community. Things started getting more violent and disconnected from the goddess energy, and the ecstatic fire of the early Lemurians faded over time. 10. The Destruction of Mu More and more giants, as they multiplied all over the world, settled down in Mu, and many more of the violent and non-spiritual ones arrived as they noticed that the Lemurian people were easier to deal with because they didn't have an army or any real defense system. This, of course, was because they never had had to deal with war and violence before to any greater deal. History started repeating itself, and groups of Nephilim giants invaded cities and tribes and took humans as slaves. Some of them were eaten. It came to a point in certain regions of Mu, I feel, especially in the eastern regions, which now is the North and South American western shores, when whole tribes had to hide in underground caves in order to stay away from praying Nephilim. All of a sudden, severe earthquakes and tsunamis started haunting the lands, the weather changed drastically all over the planet, and some chunks of the continent fell apart and sunk under the ocean. It seems to have been a gradual process and not a one event but many humans and giants died when the volcanoes erupted and land and water changed position. Of course, all this was due to orchestrated events, as A.AM.E entered the solar system and was intentionally setting course towards Earth. Enlil was behind it, as many of us know, 
but the whole story will be told in the next paper, and it differs from both Sitchin's and any other version I know of, simply because certain factors regarding the deluge have been overlooked. For the first time in the history of the Lemurians, diseases, plagues, and other serious conditions spread across the land, and many shamans who still had some psychic powers could feel the end was near. The weather became more and more erratic and new kinds of diseases spread between the tribes. Although the Lemurians were not a technological society as that of Atlantis, there was a lot of wisdom that would be lost if Mu was destroyed, and the leading shamans and their council of priests and priestesses were of course well aware of this fact. This wisdom had to be safeguarded for the benefit of future generations. According to Lissa Royal, who is channeling Germain, 300 years before the final cataclysm, around 11,200 BC, the shamanic elders and their inner circle started storing information in all different ways possible. One of the more profound way was that of storing data in seed crystals. Allegedly, these crystal were programmed with the knowledge of old Mu. Reliable and well-trusted couriers were then sent out to different parts of the world, rich in crystal in growth. This way, the seed crystals could program other crystals with the same information, which would be stored in this fashion for potential civilizations to come, for those of the right consciousness to decode it. It is a known fact that crystals are transmitters and receivers of information. Other ways the Lemurian priesthood stored knowledge was by writing on stone and clay tablets, similar to the later Sumerians, and in hieroglyphs on cavern walls in their hidden refuge places. When all this was done, the priesthood and sometimes their entire tribes went underground and stayed there through the cataclysm so that they could come up safely afterwards and start receding the planet. Their hiding places were deep inside Earth, away from the continent, on the American West Coast. As we know, many Native Americans say they come from underneath the Earth. They, and the Mayans, the people, not the Mayan gods, are definitely offspring from the Lemurian civilization. We still can see ruins from the Lemurian cultures all the way through Arizona and New Mexico. There are places called cenote. They are extremely deep holes, filled with water. There is one on the Yucatan Peninsula at Chicken Itza. But there is also another one outside of Sedona, called Montezuma's Well. The latter is one of the major emergence points for those who stayed underground and came out after the final Lemurian cataclysm a lot of giants died as well as humans when the continent finally sank, while others made it to safer grounds, both in mountain areas, which are now atolls and islands in the Pacific, further out west, China, Mongolia, Japan, east, the American continents, and south, New Zealand and Australia. The Pleiadians say in a few different lectures that within some mountains on the west coast of the American continent there are sleeping giants, of the nicer kind, who will not wake up until a certain level of consciousness is raised on the planet, and sometimes they leave signs or indications as of where they are sleeping. According to them the awakening of the sleeping giants will be soon. Fig 6-16 shows the face of a bearded giant, carved out from the mountainside. Does the inside of this mountain in Peru perhaps house a sleeping giant? 11. In the aftermath of the Lemurian Cataclysm When everything was over, millions upon millions of people, and many of the Nephilim giants who roamed Mu, had died. What exactly happened to the Titans is not known, as no information can be found about them from what I know. A few of them may have survived, however, because elongated skulls of both humans and giants, Titans, have been found, in the western part of South America, and around Peru in particular. Many of those have been dated to about the 1500s AD. For an overwhelming amount of proof and evidence, visit archaeologist Brian Forster's Facebook, and his YouTube account type in his name. His research is enormously appreciated. Left were the islands and the spread out land masses we more or less see today. The oceans calmed down and the extreme weather phenomena subsided. What is now more or less at sea level was during the Lemurian era high ground. That's why we still can see ruins of statues and volcanic footprints of giants, etc. Giants, as the legends go, preferred the mountain regions and high ground in general, and that's where we find many of the remnants of old civilizations. 
There are many places in the Pacific Ocean and on the American continent which still show us the glaring truth that the Lemurian civilization existed, and they are too many to bring up here. The most famous ones are probably the statues on the Easter Island, the ruins and wall carvings in Arizona and New Mexico, and the history and evidence of the Mayan culture. We have learned from the Bible, and many other more ancient texts from which the Bible has developed, that the flood wiped out almost all of the world population. I haven't mentioned the conflicts that happened behind the scenes between Syrians and Pleiadians which eventually led to that the deluge happened, because this paper has focused on the Lemurian civilization, while the next one will tell us what occurred in the rest of the world, and particularly on another huge landmass in the Atlantic Ocean, which was taken out by the flood as well. I am of course talking about Atlantis. The misuse of energy, abused technology and elitism that eventually became predominant in Atlantis was the main reason why the flood happened. We are now going back to the place where the split between human groups occurred, when EA let his creation spread out over the globe to develop their abilities as a part of the experiment. Lord EA himself did not go to Mew. Those who wanted to follow him did so and landed in Atlantis, a civilization which started out much later than that of Mew. However, while the Mu civilizations concentrated on spiritual matters, EA and his followers ended up choosing technology. Albeit, in the beginning this was not the case, just the result from choices EA and others made along the way. We are now going to move back in time to when the Mu civilizations were still on the height of their spiritual power, before the Watchers came. This was approximately the time Atlantis, as we know it, became populated by EA's people.